I am taking the liberty, actually, of changing the title that Gordon gave me to Oops. to a somewhat broader title, and you will see in the course of my talk why I did that. Um, where we're coming from is really the tail end of applied uh, science, namely <clears throat> the quest of changing the performance of what we're all trying to get to, namely personalized healthcare, precision medicine. And that actually reminds me to issue a disclaimer. Uh, as opposed to all of you, I'm actually not a card-carrying glycobiologist or glycoscientist. I spent the better part of my career in <clears throat> the development of personalized healthcare precision medicine, and that is what attracted me actually to, uh, to join the field and to join Intervena company that is very deeply vested in uh, glycoproteomics, as you all know. So the Somehow this is not advancing. Let me just, this is, this is better. So the bane of uh, personalized healthcare obviously is the availability of biomarkers that informs us about <clears throat> the very s specific attributes of any one patient and how they may or may not respond to a therapy. And uh, what we have here is a bunch of biomarkers from the nucleic acid realm as well as from the protein-based realm. And what you see here is that, by and large, the performance of these biomarkers is really nothing to write home about with relatively uh, low either sensitivities or specificities. And so um, the um, idea that we had in terms of looking at glycoproteomics was that we could dramatically expand the depth and the breadth of the repertoire of potential biomarkers using uh, glycoscience, using glycans, which clearly add many, many orders of magnitude to the complexity of um, potential biomarkers, particularly if you combine proteins, proteomics, and glycomics. And uh, in first approximation, that massively larger repertoire of, um, of analytes should translate into a more, much more informative repertoire of analytes, particularly also because as opposed to genetics genomics, which is sort of, if you will, fairly upstream and remote in the biological, in the, in the cascade of biological biomarkers uh, from genetics to proteomics and post-translational proteomics, uh, with uh, glycoproteomics, post-translational proteomics, you really are much, much closer, much, much more proximal to where uh, biology happens in a dynamic fashion on a day-to-day -day basis, if you will. And so by uh, combining proteomics and uh, glycomics, we uh, believe we're opening the door to this powerhouse of glycoproteomics. Obviously, you're all familiar with the fact that um, up to 70% of all secreted uh, proteins are glycosylated. And uh, <clears throat> this, uh, and again, I'm preaching to the choir here, of course, uh, glycosylation of a protein clearly affects its structure, its um, uh, conformation, and therefore also its, um, its function. And of course, no talk about glycoproteomics can be completed these days without mentioning the world's most famous glycoprotein, namely the S antigen of the HIV vi uh, of the COVID virus. And, and in as much as Obviously, we all deplore what happened over the last couple of years. One of the upsides of actually the COVID pandemic might be that there's been a little bit more attention paid and, 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 uh, and uh, publicity to the fact that proteins are glycosylated. And so we still obviously are all engaged in the task of um, uh, explaining and uh, proselytizing to the world how important glycosylation is, and that, I guess, is one of the small upsides. So um, the best example that I always uh, use to illustrate how powerful glycoproteomics could be in the uh, realm of uh, personalized healthcare is actually a molecule or a, a test that most of us are familiar with, namely prostate-specific antigen. And we all know that it's actually not a terribly good test. Uh, and that may very well have to do with the fact that when we talk about 
uh, PSA, we ignore the fact that it is actually a number of different molecules, as many of you may be familiar with, some of which are quite uh, typical, namely the tetra and the uh, triantenary one for, um, pa uh, for prostate cancer versus the biantenary form that's uh, typical for uh, the healthy state or benign prostatic hypertrophy. And if you're using the conventional immuno tools, uh, such as an ELISA, to test or to measure PSA, you're basically just throwing all these apples and oranges into one bucket and looking at the peptide backbone without distinguishing these uh, more subtle sub-entities, and that results then in a very poorly performing test. Um, whereas if we're using the submolecular resolution of mass spectrometry uh, and specifically hone in on the molecules associated with cancer, then what we get is a much, much better receiver operating characteristic and a test that really very reliably differentiates um, uh, the, the wheat from the chaff. Uh, so why isn't everybody in the clinic using uh, glycoproteomics? Well, because it is a tall order. We need these expensive, complicated, to some extent rather temperamental instruments, um, expert operators, uh, they're expensive, uh, and yet they've actually improved dramatically over the last 10, 15 years, so that at this point we can easily run uh, 100 patient samples uh, within a day or two, and that provides us with precisely the resolution of information of uh, <clears throat> what is the glycan, where is it, uh, what site is it associated with in the protein, and what protein is it, um, which, of course, immediately closes down the next bottleneck. Namely, these are very large data files, and as, of course, you're all familiar with, uh, the readout of these uh, chromatograms are not nice sinusoidal curves that are easy to, um, uh, to interpret, but very, very ragged and, and complicated peaks. And so the... the uh, standard of care, if you will, up until now, even with the best conventional softwares, was that um, uh, processing a data file of 100 patients with 1,000 uh, individual um, uh, features would really take a PhD eight months full-time at 45 seconds per feature. So this is where our, our company actually started, which was founded by a serial entrepreneur who is a software engineering entrepreneur who's worked in, 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 um, in blockchain and video image processing uh, and uh, who was interested because of a strong family history of cancer uh, for which he could not really get any answers using genetics or genomics uh, to apply a different set of biomarkers. And so what they did was uh, set up using artificial intelligence and neural networking a process that uh, over a multi-stage neural, recurrent neural network uh, system provides uh, an output that very specifically predicts the likelihood of where the human observer, who is still the gold standard for interpreting uh, these chromatograms, would actually call the beginning and the end of a peak, uh, such that uh, these are the manual labels and the likelihood uh, curves that the program predicts uh, coincide very, very nicely with what a human observer would call this. This was validated uh, across many, many different uh, molecules uh, uh, with an extremely high uh, a correlation between the machine and a expert human annotator. And uh, we've been using this now uh, to uh, apply glycoproteomics to clinical studies. So the way we, uh, so the, the way this works is that we now very, at a extremely high speed are able to convert the chromatograms into data files that are easily interpreted by biostatisticians, and that has allowed us to cut down the time that it took eight months for a PhD a scientist to literally five minutes on the server. And that really, for the first time, has allowed us to scale up uh, glycoproteomics, and specifically glycoproteomics in liquid biopsies, so in peripheral blood, to where it could meaningfully apply it to the large clinical sample numbers that you need to have to, uh, to test this for applicability in clinical scenarios. The way we run this is uh, with a very simple standardized workflow that avoids a lot of the more uh, esoteric approaches such as <coughs> uh, 
depletion of uh, abundant proteins such as concentration or enrichment, we just go ahead use a very small, num uh, very small amount of serum or plasma, we take it through a triptych digest, and then we apply it directly to the LCMS uh, platform in an exploratory workflow, workflow where we uh, use very high-end instruments, obviously low throughput, so we develop a set of classifiers, a set of uh, spectra using a small number of the phenotype contrasting samples in each indication, healthy controls, cancer patients or whatever you have. Um, we then process this data through our software. We continuously add to our growing database library of glycopeptides. And then we take a first stab uh, with um, uh, bio, bio statistics, filter out the few hundred or maybe a thousand, in each case, most informative glycopeptide differences between the cases and the controls. These are converted into MRM panels. Now we can apply that very specific uh, um, uh, these very specific uh, 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 glycopeptide analytes to, on a triple cure instrument, to a much, much larger number of samples at a very high throughput, very high quantitative fidelity, and we end up generally then processing it once again, again through our software with a half a dozen to two dozen of um, glycopeptide differences that carry the bulk of the information. Those are then modeled by machine learning uh, uh, into multivariable algorithms that we, conf uh, we refer to as our glycoproteomic classifiers, and they can then be tested again on additional uh, patient cohorts. So what we're looking at with this workflow is somewhat counterintuitive and um, paradoxical with regard to what the rest of the world is doing. All of them, the, all of the cell-free DNA, the ctDNA approaches that Garden and Grail are using for early detection of cancer depend on material that's being shed by the tumor. This is why they have trouble actually recognizing early stage tumors, as well as why they need fairly large quantities of serum or plasma. What we're looking at are only are a set of relatively few, some 70 or 80, quite abundant uh, circulating plasma proteins, um, somewhere down to about 200 nanomolar. So these are by and large uh, acute phase reactants, um, immunoglobulins, complement factors, proteins generally primarily uh, synthesized in the liver or in plasma cells, B cells. Um, and what we're looking at here is actually a systemic response of the body towards the presence or absence or certain attributes of the disease rather than the disease specifically itself. And we're still not quite clear how this actually hangs together. This is why, as of lately, we have actually, in addition to the effort of just looking at patient samples, have set up a laboratory of functional glycobiology. And Thomas Lafcaval, who is here in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the audience, is one of the scientists who works there, to actually drill down and get a better explanation as to how these two observations are linked together. Um, it's important to stress that um, what we look at is primarily the different uh, representation or relative abundances of individual glycoprotein isoforms. So we do not really depend on measuring the level of the protein accurately, although we, tr we strive to do that. This is just an, uh, uh, a, a, an iconic example of if you have a particular glycoprotein uh, where in the healthy uh, control, version A or isoform A is at 20% and isoform B is at 80%, even though in the diseased uh, situation, you may have exactly the same level of 100 micrograms per milliliter. Now we have a shift where glycoprotein isoform A is more highly represented than isoform B. This is perfectly enough for us, and this is what we usually actually encounter. Not so much changes in the level of the protein from patients to controls, but changes in the relative presence of individual glycoisoforms. So it's really a very, very powerful approach. We've applied this to a number of different conditions over the last couple of years. Started out in uh, oncology. Um, our first big study, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, was in ovarian cancer. We've since applied it 
to uh, lung cancer, to pancreatic cancer, to kidney cancer, to nasopharyngeal cancer, uh, to uh, hepatocellular cancer. And the amazing and really striking uh, and almost too good to believe uh, observation we made, made that in each and every one, literally, of these applications, we find these very impressive uh, performances, uh, very nice area, areas under the receiver operating characteristic of quite commonly 90% or more in indications where no such tests uh, uh, exist so far. Um, and then in this particular indication, uh, and this is why I changed the title, uh, of hepatocellular carcinoma, we also by chance had some samples with non-alcoholic state of hepatitis. And while clearly the signal in liver cancer is quite massive, we also found a very nice predictor in, um, in, uh, in NASH. And that opened our eyes that what we're looking at here is really something that is ubiquitously important and informative way beyond just oncology. And we have, as you will see, applied this to a number of different disease categories uh, since then and been very successful. So um, the ovarian cancer story was really the first big experiment that we did, trying to replace um, what is the current clinical state of the art, a cancer biomarker that distinguishes benign uh, pelvic masses or tumors from malignant ovarian carcinoma. And patients that come to observation with a newly diagnosed pelvic mass, about 20% of them will actually have ovarian carcinoma. But at this point, 90% of them undergo surgery uh, because there's just not a very good marker to distinguish. Uh, when we applied our platform to this question, uh, we right away found a very powerful uh, classifier that we were then, this is in retrospective samples, we were then able to validate that in a set of prospective samples and that gave us the confidence to actually embark in a prospective uh, clinical observational trial, multi-site trial and international trial. Half of the patients were, uh, were recruited in the US, the other half in uh, Southeast Asia. And what we found, much to our delight, was that the classifier uh, that was uh, developed on these retrospective samples, very nicely validated in the real world population, while CA125 uh, gave the expected somewhat lackluster uh, uh, performance. The reason I'm highlighting this is because of a second very, very important milestone that we crossed with this study, and that was can we actually reduce a rather complicated assay to, uh, to practice? Can we make it or, for, uh, or, or, or transform it into a clinically and analytically validated regulatory compliant assay that can actually be used by doctors in practice? And that is not a slam dunk, and it's not anything, as you all know, for the faint of heart, uh, because it's not, never been done before. And I'm, I was very nervous, but now <laughs> very, very uh, 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 happy to report that we were able to do this. And so this ovarian cancer test is now a fully regulatory CLIA CAP compliant laboratory developed test that is uh, available to physicians. Um, let me touch on the other point that I just made, namely that this applies not just to uh, cancer, but much more broadly. Um, we were very intrigued by the initial observations in NASH, which was based on a very small number of samples. We then went on and uh, studied a much larger number of samples, and once again were able to, re uh, to replicate or confirm the performance of this test at, once again, a almost uh, too good to be true uh, performance level. And in this particular case, not only could we very clearly distinguish patients with NASH from happy, healthy controls, but we can also, with the same uh, uh, panel, differentiate between early NASH and late-stage NASH. So there's no other test on the market at this point that can do that. Um, let me move on to some other uh, um, applications, and we've already been talking about COVID. So this is a study that we were able to do uh, with uh, uh, Stanford University, where we got access to a number of individuals that had uh, a very severely symptomatic course of COVID. Uh, we're all admitted to the hospital or to the ICU, and a set of individuals who 
uh, had a completely asymptomatic course of COVID. Those are people that arrived at the Red Blood, uh, at the Red Blood, uh, at the Red Cross blood donation station to donate blood and were found to be seropositive, never knew that they had COVID. And so what you can see is a very, very stark contrast here. We had an interesting uh, additional set of uh, controls, namely individuals with bacterial sepsis. And while you see that there's obviously somewhat more similar to the, co to the severe COVID cases, there's clear differences there, such that this is not just an inflammatory reaction that we're seeing here, but something very specific to COVID. And then likewise, another indication in the space of infectious disease, HIV, where we recently had uh, the opportunity to study a number of individuals that had fully treated HIV, so undetectable viral load. These are individuals that for all intents and purposes look exactly like a healthy individual, except for being seropositive. They have normal CD4, normal CD3, normal CD8 counts. Um, and yet, when you look at them at the level of their plasma glycoprotein, proteome, they're like day and night. So very, very stark. We're continuing to look into this uh, to uh, gain more insights into what exactly we're looking at here. Uh, these are very early preliminary results. And then the last set of indications that I'm going to talk about that we applied this platform to is again one in oncology, but it, this time it is predicting therapy response, specifically to immune checkpoint inhibitors. These, as many of you may be familiar with, are really have, have uh, brought about a sea change in the treatment of cancer, extremely powerful drugs with the downside that they only work in a subset of cancer patients. So one in three, one in four, dependent on the indication. And at this point, there's really no good biomarkers to predict who will or who will not be a responder. The one that's most, u most commonly used is uh, PD-1 or PDL one uh, And as you can see, in malignant melanoma, it's basically useless. And the, 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 uh, the uh, and oncologists actually are not even using it anymore for malignant melanoma. When we applied our platform to this, again, in a relatively small pilot study of about 40 patients, immediately we found a uh, classifier that gave us a hazard ratio of nine. Uh, very clearly distinguishing individuals that did very well on the, uh, on the therapy versus those that uh, really uh, fared very, very poorly. And again, here we have been able uh, uh, more recently to complement this with a much larger study um, with about 200 or more than 200 individuals. And again, the, indivi the, uh, the initial uh, observations held very nicely. And what you see here is that individuals that test positive for our test, and we call that the Don IO immuno-oncology melanoma test, um, in other words, are predicted to respond to the therapy. They have a median uh, progression-free survival time of 17 and a half months versus those that test negative, i.e. are predicted to not benefit from the therapy, have a median progression-free uh, uh, survival uh, uh, progression fee, uh, survival time of two and a half months only. So this is the second test that we have now uh, put on the market. Uh, it's available to oncologists and it's uh, being uh, uh, launched as we speak. It was announced at this year's American Society of uh, Clinical Oncology meeting. So at this point, we really believe that with glycoproteomics and glycoscience, we may just have a new crystal ball for the practice and the progress of uh, precision medicine, personalized healthcare. And let me close with a quote by a famous physicist, uh, and I hope to have at least uh, uh, contributed to what he was saying, namely, uh, before I came here, before you came here, you were confused about the subject. After my lecture, you may still be confused, but hopefully at a somewhat higher level. Enrico Fermi. Uh, thank you all so very much for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer some questions.